Well, hello, everybody. Um, it's a daunting challenge to be the last session, but I think we have a presentation here that will really catch your interest. Um, first, a little introduction. Uh, my name is David Engel. I'm currently the superintendent of schools in North Platte, Nebraska, far from the ocean. However, I was born and raised on the shores of Puget Sound, and I've lived most of my life on the streams, rivers, and shores of Puget Sound, and been in close contact with folks we're going to talk about here in this session. Um, before we get into the conversation, I want to take just a moment to recognize someone that you all know is special, who has reached out to sponsor this particular project through his Foresight Foundation, and that's Mark Anderson. Um, as a futurist, Mark's specialty is looking out five years or next week. But people don't realize that Mark also has this long view side of him, represented by the Foresight Foundation. And that is, um, he's taken the perspective of what is the richness of Puget Sound about. Uh, certainly has a biological perspective, and so talking about DNA and, and uh, orca all makes sense uh, in his life. But he also has a cultural interest in uh, the human populations of the Puget Sound area and how they relate to the, the um, environment, the, the ecology of the area. So this project is, in my view, part of Mark's uh, long view of things and how to um, pull from the past for forward um, important aspects of the Puget Sound culture. I'm going to introduce a, a very special person here in a second. Uh, first, I, I need to let you know that a very Early on in my life, my mother sat me down, and uh, my mother, if you knew her, has, has been a lifelong environmental activist, and her claim to fame is that she helped preserve the Nisqually Delta in Puget Sound from the, any kind of development or exploitation, so that we now have a fairly pristine delta in Puget Sound to, to look at and visit and, and enjoy. But she sat me down early in life and said, David, <clears throat> there are going to be a lot of issues in your life, um, both self-generated and uh, incidental, but the one issue that will never go away, the one issue that your generation's got to solve for, is about water. And, you know, growing up in the Northwest where it rains quite a bit and water's everywhere, I said, what do you mean? <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, so this conference, if anything, has driven home the justice and rightness of my mother's advice this uh, conversation we're about to have is also about water, and let me tell you why. I did a little research on Lashutsi, the language, and what does the word mean? And it actually uh, means saltwater language. And so uh, today I'd like to introduce Jay Miller, who has the honor of uh, preserving and looking at how to bring forward uh, the, the legacy of the Lashutsi language, which is the language spoken in central Puget Sound um, by the um, First Peoples. The First Peoples um, Puget Sound go back, we think, at least 10,000 years. Oh, at least, least 10,000 years. So this is an ancient uh, language. Um, so before we get in our conversation, I want to put an analogy in your heads to help guide our thinking here. And that is, uh, I will uh, give you this analogy to, to use as a framework. Language is to culture as DNA is to an organism. I believe it's that important. And so in this conversation, I think Jay will, will help us see the, the wisdom of that. Um, Jay, when I went online and did a little Google search to see who I was interviewing, has the honor of being one of the few people published uh, who's done work with the and with understanding the native culture um, throughout Puget Sound. So he's written some books. Uh, the most recent, I think, is Shamanic Odyssey in 1999. Well, actually, Lashutseed Culture and Shamanic Odyssey. OK, so you, you're 2001. I have to get a newer computer. <laughs> um, and he's written a number of essays, all very interesting. And then he uh, sent me a book, or a, a long essay on the um, Pawnee tribes um, who are my neighbors now in North Platte, and I've got some reading to do there. Um, but Jay, describe for us uh, what your project is and how you're documenting the Lashutseed 
through its last living speakers and, and talk to us a little bit about the culture you're describing. Uh, first, I have to say, which is Lashutzid for thank you, to Mark and Fire uh, to inviting me here. Um, the project I'm involved in has to do with a remarkable family from the Seattle region. Um, its key member uh, in my lifetime was Takshavu by Hilbert, who died at the end of last year. She was the last person to speak the language, having learned it in a natural context. Um, it was in that extremely bleak period that I ran into Mark, and he provided encouragement um, and funding. That had the effect of turning around a particularly critical situation. There is one competent speaker left. Um, he's trained as a civil engineer. He has all of these computer skills. He has fluency in the language. But he has something that is very much like chronic fatigue. First, he will not undertake any job in his contracting firm that he know he can't, he can't finish. So there was a financial hardship. There was a health, this ongoing health issue. But I have to say, once I mention Mark's encouragement, my presence at this conference, and the fact there was funding to finish a dictionary project, which is incredibly crucial, because it looks at one of the earliest dictionaries in terms of everything we've learned in terms of 150 years. His health turned around. He still goes into periods of, of uh, feebleness. He still has migraines, but he's actually working. And that is due to the encouragement that Mark and the Andersons and Fire has already given to this project. Um, in order to give you a context, because in the Seattle area, as throughout North America, Native people tend to be invisible. Uh, in many cases, that's fine with them, because it, it helps keep their traditions going. It keeps down the level of trauma, which is ongoing. Um, but through this all, we have the inspiration of Taksha Blue. So if I can run through a couple, just five images to give you the context. All right, this is Puget Sound. The big map is the locations of all the rivers and ma the major features in the area. In Lashutsi, all of these names still exist. Native people still use them even if they don't speak the language. Uh, because they're the tribal names. Every tribe, every river was a dialect. Um, we were, people were able to pick up details of that dialect information in the 1920s and 30s. Um, there's a manuscript, in fact, of place names in the Smithsonian, which Vi and I and Zeke, the, the last really competent speaker, have worked on over the years. On the top is a billboard that you'll find all over Puget Sound talking about resurrecting the endangered situation of Puget Sound with all of the concerned groups and their logos represented. The problem with Lashutzi research is we fall between the cracks. Uh, we're not affiliated with any single tribal organization. That was Vi's decision in the very beginning because immediately things get very political and territorial. Um, and we're also willing to undertake research, going back to the older records, looking in terms of um, what we now know as opposed to what people were getting in the 1850s, 1860s. Um, and generally, tribal organizations um, are not encouraging of this kind of research. Um, we're also willing to talk about religious issues in a guarded, um, uh, sometimes I call them shy uh, fashion, uh, which also prohibits us from applying to certain tribal organizations for funding because that kind of information is regarded as sensitive and is not supposed to be um, shared with the wider world. This is Taksha Blue herself. And to give you an idea of her career, one of the things she did early on was made the transition. She, she learned to write the language in the 70s and went back and 
um, transcribed, translated, uh, and published in book form with my help and several other people's help. Uh, materials that had been gathered in the 50s. But then she began to tell the stories. First she became um, a sort of commentator by having a tape recorder in front of her, reel to reel in the, in the first occasion because that's how the tapes were made, um, and then commenting on the tape itself. And then eventually she became uh, confident enough to tell the stories. At that point, her career became international. The Clintons named her a national treasure. Um, she traveled around the world telling stories. But that meant that we never had a chance to clean up the basic data. Um, one of the things she did when she became a storyteller is she decided she needed the traditional costume. And in Puget Sound, the traditional costume was made out of cedar bark. and so. Uh, with the um, help of weavers in the area, she had a cedar bark dress made. The virtue of cedar bark clothing in the Northwest is it is sustainable. You do not cut the tree. You simply strip some of the bark from the tree. Uh, the tree continues to live. Uh, both Clothing and baskets and containers were made out of cedar bark. So once Vi had this dress, the dress itself became an inspiration. And when the Samish, one of the groups to the north of Seattle, fought desperately for federal recognition and a legal identity in the, in the federal and state system, and they were turned down because there was no proof that they had done things continuously as a coherent body, they decided that they would have a carved image erected in a, a state park of one of their ancestors or ancestresses who married an oyster in that area. And it, the Maiden of Deception passed, was carved, but the dress on the woman was modeled after Vi's dress, which is why she's there. By the end of her life and her public life, um, Islandwood had been founded, which is an ecological training center, education center on Bainbridge Island. There's a great hall. At the end of the great hall is a stage like this, and there's a pillar holding up the roof. That pillar was carved in the likeness of Vi, and that's the image in the lower left. So she went from being, having her clothing um, inspire various artworks in the area to herself becoming an artwork in a, in a particularly crucial center for ecological learning in the area. She was uh, more and more involved in the public arena. The Welsh National TV did a video of her life, the CD of her life. I have copies here, not many, but anyone who wants one, just ask for me and I'll ask me and I'll. Uh, gladly give you one. Uh, as I said, she became a national treasure. And then uh, she had always had the idea of taking Chief Seattle's power song and a healing song from a, a shaman in the North area and, it, and having a symphony composed. Well, somebody took that idea and in fact wrote a symphony and it was performed by the uh, Seattle Symphony. Uh, you can see uh, a perfect illustration of the cash flow of Lushutsi culture during her life because she's wearing a blanket. And on that blanket, members of the audience have come up and pinned money. Uh, we made several hundred dollars in, uh, in the course of the opening of the symphony. But she was always involved in the cultural life of her people. She was the one person who would speak in the language at namings, at winter ceremonials. Um, and in the upper corner is Vi speaking in Lushutzi at Zeke's naming. And Zeke is our last coherent speaker. Um, and it, it has the effect of basically passing on the mantle to Zeke.
vibe built on family traditions. Kwakolza was her aunt Susie. This is the woman who, in the 1950s, well, before her whole life, she had had all of the traditions of her people on the Skagit River poured into her head um, every night in her old age after she was blind. She would tell herself a different story so she would keep them alive. One day in 1951, a local music teacher from Seattle showed up with a tape recorder um, he had an interest in native language and music. The family did not have electricity. So he went back a week later, and the family, her family, her children, had installed electricity in the house. As a result of that, we have a massive body of information, which Vi and I and other peoples, I translated a lot of it and produced a 400 and some odd, some odd page book. Um, but we haven't yet to do all of it. Um, and at one point, we actually tried to work with various um, uh, voice recognition equipment, dragon speak and whatnot. But by that point, Vi was blind. And she couldn't read the basic paragraphs and whatnot into the material. Um, voice recognition help is something we really, really need. Um, later on, when Vi was uh, writing the material, she got an IBM Selectric typewriter. Um, and because more and more Salish linguists were transferring to uh, typewriters, the, uh, there was a special company in Honolulu that made a Selectric ball, one of those twisting boil, balls with the Lachute seed, well, actually, Salish characters on it. So I bought that. And then when it was decided that Lachute seed needed to be on computer, um, she called Boeing, where she had worked during the war. Um, and Boeing recommended these computers called Terex, which enabled you to create characters so that we could actually simulate the, the, the characters for the shoot seed. But they're incredibly difficult to work with. Um, and then you know, once, once uh, PCs and, and laptops came in, then we've all shifted to that. And there's a, an international community of fonts uh, that we, we use for the material. Um, so we have, looking to the past, we have all of this material from uh, Aunt Susie, Ruth Seaholm Shelton, uh, which needs to be cleaned up. Vi's work in the sort of international and global arena took Jake. time away from things. Can I ask you, yeah. um, what's the state of the recordings that you have right now? Uh, the recordings, you'll see them at the very end. Um, those have been donated to the Ethnomusicology Archive at the University of Washington. It's the largest collection they have. It's a thousand items. The problem is, Vi's idea of archiving is she would make a copy for any member of the family who asked for these things. So there are sort of iterations, and it's, it's difficult to figure out, well, and, Sometimes it's difficult to figure out which one is the original and which one is the, is the, uh, is the iteration or the copy. Um, Bai's son was also a very famous artist and was an initiate of the traditional religion in the area, he, which he portrayed in paintings, which got him into a lot of trouble with some of the native communities. But Bai always stood behind him. So we also have this artistic and pictorial record that goes with Le Chute. And then here is the Lushutsi board. Um, we all work on a volunteer basis. Uh, the money is basically to pay other people for publication and, and other materials. Uh, Vi's granddaughter has uh, stepped forward and taken on the presidency of Lushutsi research. And Aunt Susie's great grandson is getting a degree in religious studies at, with the Jesuits at Seattle U. So again, he, we can uphold. Uh, as safely as possible, as sensitively as possible, religious traditions of the area. Um, the archivist who is uh, in charge of the materials is the woman in brown. So I have a couple of questions related to this language. One is, 
when I looked up the language, they had divided the vocabulary into the salmonid and the aquatic vocabularies. Tell me a little bit about the relationship of the language to clearly the, <clears throat> the water aspects. Then. Well, the, uh, uh, in thinking in terms of DNA and, and whatnot, the language has a, a, a distinctive structure. Uh, it's, uh, each sentence is very much like a, uh, a necklace. There's a pendant, there's a, a core uh, essential element which is modified at the front and at the back. Uh, lesh shoot seed. Lesh specifically refers to the salt waters of Puget Sound. Uh, ut seed means language, speech. It also means path or trail. Um, the word that I really wanted to convey to people here is actually not a water word, but the word for land itself, swatuch did. And the core, the essence, the pendant of that word is tuch, which means to take care of. So when you, when you live in a world that takes care of you and you take care of it, um, you are in a symbiotic relationship. Everything you do affects what happens to the world around you. Um, and it is true, I keep saying that Vi grew up on the land and on the water. Her father carved canoes. Uh, and it's the, it's the water element that people have now embraced as the expression of the culture. Everybody has canoe families. Every tribal group, every intertribal group um, for the past several years has gathered in a flotilla in August. This year they're coming to Suquamish. Uh, two years ago they went to Lummi. Uh, last year they went to Cowichan. Uh, and often people from the Pacific in outriggers will come and join the flotillas when they come in. Um, in my research, there was an interesting claim that the salmon was being punished for something, and it had to go up and down the river. Um, does that? No, it doesn't ring true. Doesn't ring true. No. Um, in fact, Aunt Susie has a wonderful story about how sockeye got to Baker River. Okay. Um, no, in fact, I mean, salmon are a, a fellow species who live beyond the horizon, and they get in their canoes, and as they come through the the horizon line, their canoes tip over, and at that point, they become salmon um, and have to be, you know, every salmon to this day is ritually welcomed as an honored guest in the community. What, what part can technology play in helping um, preserve and, and move forward a language as you described it, a moribund language or a language that's described as a sleeping language? Yeah. Well, the, at this point, um, there are classes, there are teaching programs on many of the reservations, um, but I have to say they're all flawed uh, in one way or another because the, every person speaking the language all spoke English first. And so all of Lushutsi now is filtered through English with, with this one remarkable exception. Um, so our goal is to save and share and clean up the data as it exists. There, are, I mean, there are other projects. There was a, there was a, a film that was, that is in process that has to do with Vi's composition of the, of the symphony and its uh, expression as a way of healing the world after 9/11. But I'm concerned with the what we call the lifelines, the, uh, the books, the tapes, the materials that are the basis, the foundation for everything else. Okay. Can you uh, help connect the Lashutsi then with a larger family of languages, sometimes referred to as Salishan? Uh, Salish languages. Uh, the, these are languages absolutely unique to the Northwest. They don't exist. Uh, they're, they're not easily connected with other languages in North America. In the case of Pawnee in Nebraska, we know it's part of the Cadoan family. And so there's a, a, a whole series of uh, changes uh, rung in the grammar as you move from Arikara to Wichita through Pawnee. But Salish is self-contained. That's, that's the remarkable thing about it. Uh, it occurs only in the Northwest. Um, it has a group of dedicated scholars, but Vi was always adamant that her language would be the best documented language in North America and, and certainly within Salish. Um, and she, she really achieved that beyond 
wildest imaginations, in part because we do have 150 years of documentations and 50 years of recordings. Is, is that related to the fact that the kind of the urban metropolises of the Puget Sound area happen to be Wilshootsie? Yes. Uh, yeah, the, well, the, certainly the southern Wilshootsie, the southern dialect, uh, suffered the first major hit through epidemics. The fur trade post of Fort Nisqually was built there. Uh, Olympia was built there. Tacoma was built there. Um, then Seattle began the hit on northern Lachutzee. Uh, but the people up in the Skagit uh, were among the last to be occupied. And that's because that corridor had been saved for a railroad right away. And so it was settled much later. And that's where Vi came from. So it's not surprising the language survived there longer. How many speakers are left, native speakers of the Salish language? Uh, because of this, the exhibit at Seattle Art Museum, uh, Vi named it Sabadib, the gift, or the giving. Um, they're probably less than a thousand for all the Salish languages. But Salish, like uh, Kumie and, and uh, Ipe, the language here, uh, if you straddle an international border, the language generally tends to survive a little better. Uh, many of the speakers from here in the San Diego area moved into Mexico, where the language seems to be in better shape. And the same thing in the Salish area. Those people who live in Canada have much better support and encouragement for their language, because Canada is officially multilingual. So after the money goes to French and to heritage languages, it goes to native languages. So there's an active program in Canada for the preservation of the language and the encouragement of the language. But technology is eroding, um, and English is, is coming to the fore. Jay, we have about a minute and a half left here. I'd like to give people in the audience a chance to ask you some questions. So let's have the lights up and see if anybody has a question. It looks like we've outlasted. <laughs> well, I would certainly like to thank you for making the effort to be here. Um, this is, a, for me, an important conversation just to get started. And I expect to follow up and learn more about what you're doing and, and support your efforts. So uh, thank you for what you've done for this language. And um, keep up the good work. Thank you.